Hello, and welcome to this session of Mentoring Professionals, where we're going to be looking at Captain Trago and how to use it for with incident and problem management. I will hand over straight to Brendan to start the presentation. All right. Mean? Hello, hello, everybody. So one thing that I really like to do at the start here is that everybody gives me a message in the chat to write where you are. Where in the world are you? <laughs> Give me some feedback in the chat. Let's see where people are. There we have first one in London, Libya. Two in London, United Arab Emirates, London, USA. Drummen, hello, Marianne. <laughs> Miami, the US, South Africa, Brazil. This is cool. Several in the UK. More in the UK. Don't we have anybody from Ireland here? Come on, guys, show me some of the Irish. <laughs> in Netherlands, Florida. We've got a great spread. Definitely, there, there's one from India. That's nice. UK. So, welcome to the show, guys. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share my screen here. This is the full presentation that I'm going to go through. And you'll also have available uh, for this of this presentation as a PDF at the end of my presentation. So uh, you'll have, uh, and I might add some notes to this along the way. I'm using Miro, which basically is like a, a wall. So anything that I think along the way, I might just add another post-it note and add it to the wall here along the way. And I can also do that. Any questions that you guys have, please use the chat function. Dev is going to be uh, looking after the chat here, I think, and picking up questions along the way. So uh, ask anything at all and uh, do my best. I give, um, I'll ask, uh, I'll answer it as best I can. If I haven't got an answer, I'll let you guys know that I haven't got an answer to it. So just uh, at the start, so I'm Brandon and Dev is here as well. And this is a webinar based on Captain Drago. And Captain Trego is, um, it, it's from, it's like, it's been around quite a while. It's a, it's a method that's been since 1958, very quickly. Two guys, one called Captain and one called Trego. And they started looking at people who were good at doing problem management. And they wanted to see, uh, what are you doing if you do good problem management? How do you solve problems and decision? Uh, so Captain Trego is mostly known for problem solving, and teams making decisions. So this is about, it's not about which side of the bed I should get out of in the morning. This is basically a team together at work that has to make a decision. How can they make the best balanced decision? Uh, by gathering all the information and analyzing risks and then making a decision. The only part that we're going to look at today is something called problem analysis. So Kepner Trey goes four parts to it. And we'll be looking at the problem analysis, which is why this has been sort of described as uh, based on incident management and problem management. And it's very suitable for a service desk staff. That's the staff that I use this for. It's for incident and problem teams, task forces and crisis teams, and a little bit about change management. So those are the main groups of people and probably some project Project, manage, uh, project management, uh, project managers as well that I get on workshops based on Kepner Trego. And I've used this in Norway. I'm based in Norway, in Oslo, in Norway. And I've used this in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and in England, uh, in Liverpool, because that's the world's best football team. And Tanzania, we have some, uh, some people some that we help in Tanzania. Beautiful people in India who work with teams in Scandinavia. So a lot of the service desks and first line, second, third line support as hand is dealt with by teams in India. So we travel down with teams from Scandinavia down to India to get Kepner Trego working. Um, and it's like one of those things behind Kepner Trego that Kepner Trego does not solve problems. People solve problems. Uh, but this is a method to follow. I've also done this on Singapore as well, where we had a project with um, that we used to get out on some of the ships uh, that we had. Here's the tips that I'm going to give to you guys today. This is basically the whole, this is like start with the end in mind. This is what you get um, through this presentation. Uh, this is at the end of this presentation. This is basically what you should be sitting, uh, sitting with at the very end. So if people say, what did you get out of this presentation? This is what I hope you get out of it. Number one, what's the problem we're trying to solve? If you are sitting with a team trying to solve a problem, my number one rule is always 
everybody take pen and paper and write down the problem that you're trying to solve individually first, please. And then everybody around the room reads aloud the one sentence of the problem that they think everybody is trying to solve. After that, then we laugh a little bit and we say you know, things like, oh, you're crazy. That's not what we're trying to solve right now. And then we have to agree. And this is sort of like the silly cartoon that you can get with uh, with the, the the operating theater and and everybody says it's the left leg right it's the left leg that we have to amputate <laughs> and the doctor's looking at the patient pointing to the left leg and that's this is why in in when somebody's getting operated you actually use permanent markers and write this on the the right that they definitely mark the leg that has to be uh, operated on uh, so the, the, that's like a, it's a really simple tip but it's something that i use a lot so what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And we only ever solve one problem at a time. So when we're being drilled as Kepner Trego instructors, uh, um, it's always just make sure the teams are only trying to solve one problem at a time. And you can do that by if it's life or death or if it's uh, costing a lot of money or if it's the biggest problem business-wise, but only solve one problem at a time and make sure that everybody's trying to solve this, this, this problem, which means that usually we send uh, managers or so-called department leaders out of the room because they're they're not there to solve the problem so we make sure that everybody in the room is there to solve the problem and the same problem and then we write that problem on a flip over chart or on a board this is the problem that we're trying to solve so that's number one number two is create good questions so a lot of workshops that i do is called questioning skills and it gets it actually comes a lot from my mix in this as well as my trauma as a 10 year old kid where I couldn't ask anybody any questions. I could only talk about uh, football and that was it. Uh, and it's this like how to ask questions, what type of questions to ask and how to ask good questions. Number three is shift left with the questions. So not just that you should have problem management teams with good questions, not only incident management, not only first line, but let's do an FAQ with questions for the users. And then the project that we did in Singapore was we actually moved the questions, the good questions, we moved them out onto the ships so that technical boxes that might go wrong on a ship, let's move the questions that, that support are going to ask, which is a really, really good way of doing, uh, of doing support and doing incident and problem management. So we got a workshop for, with first, second, third line support, and we found the best questions that once something, once this box goes wrong out on the ship, what questions will do the support have to know? So we find the, the answers, we find the questions, and then we simplify the questions and put stickers on the box. And we did this with a, with a shop in Norway as well, with a lot of offices around Norway, where we actually put the questions. So I like this idea that if, if, uh, if I'm watching TV and my internet box uh, gets broken, I'd like to go to my internet the box on the wall and see a question, uh, a question list there that once you get through to support, these are the questions that they're going to ask, have the answers ready. And if you don't have the answers, that's totally okay. But it's nice. These are the questions that they're definitely going to ask. So that's like a saving time, it's saving energy, it's saving frustration. So that's what I mean with shift left with the questions. And number four, practice the method. This is a method and with any method, you get better using a method the more that you use it. And if you're going to wait until a crisis, like it's three o'clock in the morning in Norway and somebody calls me and says, Brendan, we've got one of those crises now. Can you help us with Kepner Trego? And it's like, we haven't trained in Kepner Trego. We haven't practiced this. So it's going to be crazy. So don't wait until the crisis, until, until you practice it. And the fun thing is that under lockdown, everybody is sitting uh, at home. So it's very difficult to get people into the same room. So how can we practice a method like Kepner Trego over the phone, and with different lags of, uh, of timing and communication over the phone. So it definitely takes practice. And five, this idea of boost skills sharing. And what I mean by that is the super skills matrix right below it. So you find the, mo the 25, the example, 25 most critical applications or systems that you have in your organization. And you get, this is like a spreadsheet and you get everybody working. And you ask them, what, what can you do, their levels of skill, where one is, I've heard about the system, but I haven't really used it. Number two, I've used it. Number three, I'm one of those really good on the system. Number four, I'm a super user on the system. Number five, I could have made the system myself. And what do you like? Where one is, you definitely don't like it. And five is, you love working in the system. And then what you would like to learn more about. So this is this super skills matrix that definitely helps us get problem management groups together and problem management teams and task force teams. So get you definitely know who to call in the middle of the night because we have our spreadsheet. Uh, and we also have this, how can we spread learning internally? 
So definitely have some people, you can hang a big L around their neck, which is, I'm only here to learn. I don't know anything about the system, but I'm here to learn. So I'm not going to come with any input, but I'd like to listen in on how the problem is solved. So that's basically what I'm going to share with you guys today. And that's all of these is what I sort of used Captain Trego in real life to do. So Captain Trego has four parts. Uh, for process areas and this is basically um, they're all color coded so anybody that works with Keptodego uses these same colors we all we all recognize and we all sort of know these diagrams there's if you can imagine that there's a fire burning um, in the city where you live and the fire brigade turn up the police turn up the ambulance turn up one of the first questions before they run into the building, one of the first questions they ask is, what's going on here? What's going on? And then they have to ask that to the right people, what's going on? And based on that, that's what Captain Trego does. So what's going on is always the decision to find out what do we have to do? Now, if we're going to use the problem analysis, that's when we go into the past. That's looking, why did that happen? What went wrong yesterday, what went wrong this morning, what went wrong last week. Then we do the red part, which is called problem analysis. Now that overlaps with what IT calls problem management. So IT has got incident and problem management and Kepnetrego's problem analysis overlaps both of those. So it's a little bit of incident and it's a, quite a bit of problem management, but Kepnetrego calls it problem analysis. Number two, what's going on? We need to make a decision. What should we do? Before we make a decision, let's get all the let's get all of the information in before we make a decision, and that's used a lot in change management. But I can't be covering that today because this is a, a one-hour uh, webinar, so I'm going to mostly be looking at the problem analysis part. But the decision analysis is basically a, a team decision, which analyzes alternatives and risks. And the yellow part could be called risk management. So it's called problem analysis. Why did it go wrong? But it hasn't gone wrong yet. It might go wrong. So in layman's terms, we usually just call that risk management. So it's potentially what might go wrong. And what are we going to do about that? And I can recommend, like some of these Kepner Trego workshops and courses are unbelievable. The Kepner Trego potential problem analysis is the simplest risk management method that I've ever seen. It's so simple that people actually use it in projects. That's how simple it is, people use it. So in most projects, I've seen people do a lot of risk management at the start, and then it just seems to be less and less throughout the project. And the potential problem analysis is just beautiful in its simplicity. And I think that's a way to describe Kepner Trego, that it's so simple that whenever people see what Kepner Trego is, everybody thinks like, I could have made this, but the whole thing is that you didn't. And somebody called Kepner and Trego did, and they made a fortune on it. Definitely you could have, because it's so simple and it doesn't bring in any really new terms, but you didn't do it. So this is um, the first part, questioning skills. So I hold workshops. I've got another order this morning to hold three more questioning skills workshops. Questioning skills for me is almost like men driving cars. Everybody thinks they're way above average, but there's definitely a lot of people out there that aren't good at driving. And it's sort of like questioning skills. People think like, why do I need questioning skills? I've been asking questions since I was, since I could speak when I was three years old. I don't need to, to practice questioning skills. But uh, in most cases we do. So there's lots of nice exercises. There's black mysteries that we call them. Uh, and we, we differentiate and we play the difference between asking closed questions and open questions. And it's so much fun. And one to one, this is fine. And then you add in time and you add in risks and you add in things that can go wrong. You add in different, uh, different interpretations of the, of the information and it, gets, it gets, just gets really funny. We're not good at asking questions. So Kepner Trego, I don't know if anybody of you have been on a Kepner Trego workshop, but there's also a very fun case called Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? And there's a, it's a very funny face where there's a farmer, there's the farmer's son, the farmer's wife, the local lorry driver, uh, the person who sold this chicken at the local fair, and everybody's got this really important information. Well, it's not that important, but we have to ask good questions to find out what is important. So... It's this differentiating between open questions and closed questions, open questions and closed questions. Whenever we have, here's the rule, whenever we have a customer in front of us, we have to ask open questions first. We ask open questions to gather information. 
open questions to gather information. That is so, so important. Anybody that's seen any detective series on TV, we, we hear them. This is like Detective Colombo and all of these super amazing detectives that have been on TV. They were all great at asking open questions. And open questions begin with what, who, where, who, why, which, all of those are open questions. And then after that, what we do is we ask closed questions. So what we do is we drill, we practice this on questioning skills workshops and somebody has been given a problem, an incident or a problem, and other people have to find out the best information from that. So, um, and th this closed question, we get people to drill this closed question. It's really simple and it's like this. So let me understood if I've understood correctly, is the problem and then you read back the problem of the information. Did I understand you correctly? And the answer you get back is, no, you didn't understand me correctly. Great, back to open question, beginning with W. What did I not understand? And that's getting back to that open question. And the user will tell you again what you didn't understand. And then you do exactly the same again. Great, let me try again. Did I understand you correctly that the problem that, you're, that I'm trying to understand it is this and you play it back and finally you'll get yes that's exactly the problem and that's that takes a lot of practice and um, when we do this in service desk we hear first line people saying so is it this that's a closed question did this happen that's a closed question are these included that's a closed question and we end up with that's not the problem that the user actually has so we differentiate between a lot on open questions and closed questions and if any of you want i've got like a list of a hundred uh, exercises like uh, and they're really fun to, to use with kids in the car or at the dinner table where you say something to the kids and they have to ask you with, with, with only with closed questions and they're dying to ask open questions. Like, can we ask open questions? I said, no, you only have to ask closed. Now here's why closed questions, we have to be really careful because to ask a closed question on something, you have to have some experience. That's really important understanding that which means that you know the possible answer. So if you say, was the car red? That means that you can only ask that question because you know that a car could be red. So the answer you get back is either yes or no. So the, one of the problems with project managers not being aware of the questions that they use is that if, they, if you have 20 years of asking questions to customers, you're going to fall into the trap of asking closed questions. And this is when I observe project managers doing this and I ask them afterwards, how do you think it went? They say, oh, it went great. I was great at asking open questions. I say, well, let's listen to the recording that we recorded. And they listen to themselves asking closed and closed and closed questions. So it's a very simple thing and it's very easy to, to practice. So everybody in the webinar here, when you go home today, or if you're at home in your office, then you go to your partner, you go to your wife, you go to your husband, you go to your neighbor and you ask an open question. You say, how was your day so far? And your neighbor will say, good. And then you'll say, open question, open question, open question. What was good about it? And then they'll say, I met lots of nice people. And then you'll say, did you meet lots of nice people? And they'll say, yes. And then you'll get this awkward silence that happens. And it's really funny. And when you go back, when you go just a little bit backwards from a, from a yes or a no, you realize that, uh oh, somebody just asked a closed question. That can be very dangerous when we're solving problems. So the whole idea of questioning skills is really nice workshops that I highly recommend uh, to do. And the way we set them up is that, that people are, this isn't difficult, but people should listen to each other on service desks, on incident management and problem management and task forces. Listen to each other. Um, what type of questions are we asking? You don't need anybody external to do this, but it's really nice exercise to do. Brendan, um, there is a great question from um, Tim Allen, um, which is about, um, let me read out the question and then hopefully you can provide an answer. Um, the difficulty I've seen is, re uh, is that in some corporate cultures, everybody is rewarded for knowing and it means that nobody will admit that they do not know something. The idea of asking questions that you do not already know the answer to is inhibited because not knowing is seen as a weakness. Is there a way to overcome this culture? That's a nice question. Um, whenever we do train this in Kepner in Kepner's Vego, what we have to do is we, we, we practice on, um, on stating if something is 100% fact or if it's not 100% fact. That's something that we, that, that, that we actually train a lot on and it's a, 
uh, on anything that we're definitely not 100% sure that it's fact, then we just put uh, NMD beside it, need more data. And it's, uh, so I, I've never seen this as a big, uh, as a big problem. Uh, I've tested these a lot with workshops between Scandinavia and India and Scandinavia and Singapore. And as long I, I've, I've always just treated it as this is what we do. If we're not sure, we just put need more data. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a, like a great answer, um, but it's something that I've never really thought of as a big problem to make it safe. Uh, I think is probably the, the, the easy way of doing this. Uh, thanks for that. Um, another question that just came in from Patrick, uh, oh, sorry, from Paul, I beg your pardon, uh, is the trick to asking open questions to disregard the fact that you may know something about the topic and asking yeah. it in a way that you can obtain other people's views? Yeah, 100%. That's a really nice way of putting it, uh, 100%. Uh, and the difficulty about this is that if a customer says to us that they want something, then we don't ask any more questions because we've done that before. We've done that 20 times before. So we get a bit lazy. It's called experience. We get a bit lazy. And if you put a totally new project manager in a room with a customer, they'll ask much better questions because they're, they don't know. They don't know. So we have to be really good about who we put in situations with experience. Experience can be a little bit dodgy, but you're going to need experience to solve the problems. So it's, it's really nice to start talking about these things and really nice to listen to your own recording uh, about uh, how you do like uh, requirement specification and projects and incident management and problem management. It's really nice to hear a recording of how you ask questions. And I do this with kids. I actually help kids do uh, this a lot and teenagers, how to help teenagers open up the world, be better at asking open questions. The typical teenagers are very shy and it's they're only if you listen to teenagers, anybody here that's got teenagers, you'll hear them in small talk asking closed questions, lots of closed questions. And once they understand this power of asking open questions, then they'll never be stuck in life. It's such an amazing skill to give to kids and teenagers. It's, it's just an unbelievable, simple skill. And the, the way I do this is actually you have to just like role play that's like a lot of what we do we just have to role play and i say to people so find out where i went on holiday last year and people say okay uh, where did you go on marianne is here one of these and she knows this marianne you can write in the chat that this is a this is an amazing silly exercise to do so if i have a, a group of 10 people in support and i ask them find out where i went on holiday last year and maybe somebody will come up with an, a question like brendan where did you go on holiday last year and I'll say, I went to London. And then they'll say, okay, there we go. We find out. And finally, after a little while, somebody will think, oh, wait, maybe he went somewhere else. Did you go anywhere else? Uh, yes, I did. I was like, okay, so uh, where did you go? <laughs> and I'll say, I went, to, uh, I went to France. And then they go, okay, thanks. I say, are you happy now? Is that all? And, and we have to be really good. Is there more information to ask? Uh, or is there more information to get and what's the best questions to ask this? So, and if we only have the customer on the telephone, if we only have the customer on the telephone once, we have to be really good at making sure that the customer doesn't come back later and say, well, you didn't ask that question. <laughs> so we have to be really good at not, uh, at not getting it. So um, th those are really good questions. Fire away with any questions that you have in the chat is really good. Um, Marianne wrote, uh, it was incredible. Everyone settled with the first question. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's really fun when people get this aha experience through uh, these question uh, exercise, these question workshops. Colin, love your approach, Brandon. Would it be possible to provide a list of good open questions? Yep, you're going to get a load. You're going to get a load of them right now inside uh, the next five minutes. You're going to get a lot of good questions to ask. Um, yeah, so this, this poster here, uh, with, with the potential endless open questions, when do you know when to stop? That's a good question. You get that as well. This poster here is a classic um, poster for Kevin Trego, and the red one is the steps of problem analysis. The, these are the steps. So number one, we need to go back and find the cause, and we're going to describe the problem, identify possible causes, evaluate the possible causes, and then find the true cause. And then what we do in make sure it doesn't happen again is really IT's incident management. So possibly the, some of these are mostly incident management, overlapping with problem management, but then we definitely do problem management. How can we stop this from happening again? Um, which in IT is sort of like possibly not given enough attention. I don't know if that's true, but it could be said that, that, we're, that 
because we're IT people that we like fixing things. So maybe we definitely don't want it to fix permanently because we like fixing things. We get cred for fixing things. So that uh, that's also a nice part of Kevin Trego. Okay, so um, just let me, before we get to these questions, just let me show you uh, this diagram here. This is sort of a, um, and it's a nice diagram to sort of explain somebody's drawing on my screen here. That's fun. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of it, but uh, it's, uh, it doesn't matter. Some red lines here, but that doesn't matter. Um, this is a nice diagram to, uh, to sort of explain incident. It's like a visualization of an incident. So on the left, we have performance. At the bottom, we have time. And at some form along the way, we have this drop in performance. And that's until we restore normal service. This is called the incident in uh, typical uh, service desk or operations. So the incident happens at some point and it's called an unplanned interruption. Users aren't happy, we're losing money, and in worst case, this could be life or death situation, that time is really going. And so incident management has to do a job. Now, Kepner Trego has a very specific definition of problem. So IT has uh, one definition, but IT's definition of a pro, or sorry, Kepner Trego's definition of a problem is answering yes to three questions, which means that if you answer yes to three questions, you have a problem. If you don't answer yes to three questions, you don't have a problem. You've got something else, but you don't have a problem in Kepner Trego. So the first one is, do we have a deviation? So uh, network, is, network is down. Do we have a deviation? Yes. Should the network be up? Yes, it should. It's down. Therefore, we have a deviation. Uh, printer does not print. Do we have a deviation? Yes, the printer should be printing. It's not printing. Do we have a deviation? Yes, we do. Is the cause unknown? No. The cause is not known. I know why it's not plugged in. There's no power. Okay, so we don't need to do problem analysis in Kepler. So this is, is the cause unknown? Yes, the cause is unknown. I don't know the cause. Then it's, uh, then we have two yeses. And the third one is so, so beautiful. It's like, do we really need to know the cause to do something effective ahead? And sometimes the answer is, no, we don't. We just reboot that server once every three months and it's fine. Okay, great. That's fine then. Then we don't need to use our time and money and energy to go back and find the cause. So this is, uh, I cycle on my bicycle and I get a flat tire, a puncture on my bicycle. Do we have a deviation? Yes, I do. Is the cause unknown? Right now, the cause is unknown. Yep. Do I need to know the cause? No, I don't. I just fix the puncture. So I don't need to do problem analysis. Okay, another I cycle, 10 minutes more, I get another puncture. Do you have a deviation? Yes. Is the cause unknown? Yes. Do I need to know the cause? This could be like a coincidence. So I just like, do I really need to know the cause? No, I just fix it. Could happen two times in one day. Cycle another 10 minutes, another puncture. Do you have a deviation? Yes. Cause unknown? Yes. Do I need to know the cause? Yeah. At some time, I'm really going to have to figure out what is the cause. And this is then we have what we call in Kepner Trago uh, problem analysis. Uh, this is the whole of problem analysis up, uh, summed up in two cards, but I can't go through everything here. Just take too long. But I will give you a really nice tip that Kepner Trego has the, this way of writing a problem, which is what is wrong with what? You write one object and one deviation. Printer A is not printing. That's it. So it's always what you see, hear, or smell, or whatever that tells you there's a deviation. So you can never have a broken printer is broken. Broken would never be a good deviation. How, what, how do you know that it's broken? Well, something, there's smoke coming from the printer. Um, server is not, uh, is not starting. Well, how do you know it's not starting? Uh, no lights, no power. Okay, so, so there's always something that, can, that we can write in. And that's why I love Kepner Trego's way of writing problems much more than, for example, the typical IT, which usually people bring in what, how it affects business outcomes is usually what people bring in. And I think, uh, I think that's a really nice way of defining a problem, uh, one object and one deviation. Um, Brandon is not motivated. He should be motivated. It's not motiv motivated. One person, Brandon, what's the deviation? He's not motivated. So it's always uh, this really simple way. So the exercise I told you at the start of, uh, of this, um, make sure that everybody can write down what problem are we trying to solve right now? People give me one object and give me the deviation to that object. What's wrong with what? Give me that and try your best to write that down in one sentence. No matter how complicated or complex it is, write that down in one sentence. 
and then you go around the room and then you, we have to some way agree what is the problem. Now, somebody wrote there in the chat that you do this, you can use this five why approach to get to the right object deviation, which is um, uh, uh, the printer doesn't boot. Or why does the printer doesn't boot? Because there's no power. Why is there no power? I don't know. So no power to, to server would be the object deviation. So once you keep asking why until you, somebody says, we don't know, and that's the level that you should solve your problems on. That's sort of like another nice tip that I didn't include earlier. What level do you solve problems? You keep asking why until you get to, I don't know. And that's where Captain Trego jumps in. All right, get ready for this. These is, uh, this, somebody asked the question uh, about this, uh, about these, questions these open questions here's about 24 open questions on this card uh, they're all they all start with uh, what or where or when or how or what or and so there's about 24 of them so if you look at the top left you'll see is and if you look at the top right you'll see is not now this is um this is if you go to if i go to the doctor and i say doctor uh, object my head deviation really painful the doctor would say, okay, Brendan, how's your neck? And I'd look at my doctor and say, what, did you hear me? I said, my head is sore. And he said, oh, Brendan, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to define the problem. I'm trying to close down. It could be your neck, right? Yeah, it could be my neck, but today it's not my neck. He says, great. And what did the doctor just do? The doctor found out where the pain is not. And that's really a, like a key to understanding problem, like problem solving. The better we find out what the problem is not, the easier it is to solve. Some people get that straight away. Some people can argue with me for like a, like half an hour or an hour and that until they finally, uh, until I finally win that argument. But the more is nots we get, this is like the typical, the typical uh, detective uh, murder mystery on TV. The more we stroke off the wife, the gardener, the neighbor, the closer we're getting to who actually killed the person, right? So we have to find all of these is nots. Who could have done the murder, but it wasn't obviously them. So now here's, here's a silly example of this. I go to my doctor and I say, doctor, I've got a really like object deviation. Head is very painful. Shouldn't be painful. So the deviation is really sore. And the doctor says, oh, what about your left toe on your little, uh, your, your little toe on your left foot? And I say, what? And he says, I've been on a Kepner Trego course. I've heard that we should define the problem. And I say, yeah, but my little toe, it's really far away, you know, it's really far away. Uh, now, now let's take an, an IT example of that. Uh, printer, is, printer in office is not working. What could it not be? Hmm, what about the coffee machine down in the first floor? How, is that working? Now that would be too far away, but it could be printer in office is not working. Uh, okay, does the light switch turn on the lights in the room? Do we have power into the office? That would be obviously closer. Does the scanner on the printer work? That would be very close. You see where we're getting? That would be extremely close. So the closer we get to what it is not, the more easier it is to gonna, it's going to be to solve. After we ask these questions, what we're going to end up with is something like before we solve a jigsaw puzzle, Everybody in the whole world, everybody says, do we have the cover of the jigsaw box, All right? We have the cover of the jigsaw box, this puzzle. Do we have that? This is what these questions get us. These questions get us the full cover of the jigsaw box. Now we're looking at factual information. And even if it's not factual, it's factual because it says beside it, need more data. So the question earlier, what happens if we don't know? that's totally fine. It's actually, we have to get in that we're not 100% sure of the answer. That's fact. That has to be factual. Because if the first shift stops at five o'clock and the next shift comes on, if we pass on wrong information to them as factual, that could actually cause more problems. That's really important. Brendan, I think um, while people are, di are di digesting that, which is, you know, I think it was really, really interesting, um, it would be a good time to do what we normally do on Mentoring Professionals, which is to get everyone to turn on their cameras and give a wave um, so we can use that as a snapshot. So please, all of you, turn on your cameras. And uh, when, I when I say so, just give a nice big wave. So hold on, let's get a few more people turning on. Uh, great. Do that. Okay. 
It's mine. I, I could do it on mine as well, <laughs> shouldn't I? <laughs> right, now give a nice wave, guys. Thank you. Fantastic. It's great to see so many of you um, back again as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, you can carry on now, Brendan. <laughs> yeah. So now here's um, these questions in Captain Drago you can't ask on the telephone to customers. That does not work. At least in Norway, that does not work. If you have a customer on the phone, you cannot say to the customer, I have some questions on a card here. And the first question is, what specific object has the deviation? Now, you might get past that. They might say, uh, my TV is not working. Uh, my next question on the right-hand side here is, uh, dear sir, what similar objects could reasonably have the deviation but do not? And somewhere along here, they're definitely going to hang up the phone. They're going to scare them with the language. So one thing that we have to always do is take these questions and make them to real life questions. Some typical, this is like a simple exercise we do. How can we find out, the, how can we ask these questions in a real simple manner? So along the left are uh, the four areas of Kepnitrego. If any of you are using like uh, problem management tools, you might see what, where, when, extent. There on the left side, what, where, when, extent, what's the problem, where is the problem, when is the problem, what's the size, extent, trend, what's the size of the problem, and the is not, what is not the problem, but could have been, where is the problem, not, but could have been, when is the problem, not, but could have been, what, it, what could have been the size of the, the problems, but not today. So the what, it's not, it's the printer, it's not the scanner. Where is it? It's in the office on the second floor, but the, the, the neighboring office, it works fine there. When is it? Well, it definitely be, uh, it, it went down at four o'clock, but it was working before four o'clock because at half past three, I definitely printed something. Uh, that's really good information to have to solve a problem. Like when do we definitely know it was working? It was working Friday. It's very strange. I can't log in, but the person beside me can log in. That's great information. What a lot of first line service desks do, they get that information and they totally ignore it. It's very strange because the person beside me can log in. Yes, but we're not talking about the person beside you. I'm trying to help you with your, with your and we can't solve it and we escalate it. And now it's like, we should have, we should have documented that information. And this extent is all about numbers. So, what we, what we do in real life is we take those questions and we have to get them sort of. And this is, this is roughly the questions that I put on the ships in Singapore, uh, on these technical boxes. So what we did was that we looked at things that went wrong the last couple of years, the last three years. And we said, if those have gone wrong the last three years, they're probably going to go wrong again. That's basically what we're saying. So, and that we say is, what's the most specific thing? and printers obviously not enough. Okay, so there's a little sticker on the printer. Read me the name of that sticker, please. Because if I'm going to escalate this to second line, I need that name. And, and what is it not, but could have been. So we gather as much of this information uh, as possible. And this is also, it's based on what, uh, which users have the problem, Geographically, if we're doing service over uh, different areas, then we do uh, either which country, which department, which floor in the building, which office are you sitting in. So geographically, as much as possible. Uh, and it says question to the void, question to, there's no more information to get. That's a really nice uh, uh, term used in Captain Trago. Keep question to the void. Question to the neighbor till, uh, till uh, the customer says, oh, uh, th there's no more information to give you. Great. Uh, anybody that's been interviewed by the police, they definitely know that they're trained. Police are trained in questioning skills and they're all, always trained to, to question to the void. Um, and at what time, uh, what time did you first notice it? But we, be very careful about it because it's noticed. That doesn't mean that it was working just before that. So we're definitely going to mark that with need more data. The customer said that they couldn't print at four. So we have to need more data, be very careful. It might have been down before that, but we don't know. That's fact. That's fact. Um, what's, what's the pattern here? Is this continuous that the server is down? Is it random? Is it, is it periodically? If something's periodically, it's extremely fun problem solving. I tell you that because then it's going to be, and what do you see? In five minutes, it's going to go down again. Where do you see? There, there's my five, four, three, two, one. There you go. It's not available. The router has gone down again, just as planned. What did I tell you? What's going on? If we get periodic problems, there's a real fun to solve. And these all helps us. We're getting logs out of servers. We're getting logs out of systems. And this is going to help us do all of this. 
Um, so these are typical questions that you can really shift left, put on stickers. You can even do them simpler than this. I have uh, some that are in Norwegian that we've used with Kommuna here in Norway. Um, and then we know we know what names to expect on the different uh, machines. So we create stickers and we put them out. Uh, and if it's a user can't log in, we definitely know what the username should start with. So give me the specific username that can't log in. Uh, give me specific usernames of the, na the neighbor beside you that can log in. That's critical information. Now this, if we imagine that first line can ask these questions and we get the answers and then we can send that to second line or third line support. That's a beautiful way of doing support. What do we do? Where do we start in real life? We go to third line or go to second line and first line and get them together in a workshop and say, when this goes wrong, second line, third line experts, what information do you need to solve the problem? And those are the questions that we have to ask. That's like always the way you got to do it. You got to do it that way. And then after that, then we say to second line, if you're not allowed to send the ticket back to first line because they're missing information. Tell them exactly the information that you need. Now it can be that the customer doesn't have the information, that can be, but then we write that in the ticket. We ask the question, so we get rid of that when we call the customer again, but I already told you guys this, and then you apologize, I'm really sorry, but we're not that good at documenting. <laughs> so we have, to be, we have to be like, really, we do this a workshop, you set off a three hour workshop with first, second, third line, and you say, what's the information that we need to solve the problem? And then you ask the questions, and then you mix them with these questions, and that's what you ask the customers, those are the stickers that you make. And that's how you can improve, uh, um, like if any of you know Little's Law, it's like the only real measurement that you need in, in, in incident the problem. And then you can definitely see the reduction in little law because we're making the customers better. We're making first line better. The whole escalation, we don't, we don't, we go, we, we aim for a zero of um, ping pong back and forward of, of tickets. So it's like any ping pong back and forward is just like, it's just ridiculous. So that is um, basically um, these tips. I go back to these tips here. Hope this was an okay intro for you guys on this. Here's the quests, the tips that I told you at the start. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Make sure everybody knows exactly the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, write it down, get it on the flip over, get it on the, the board, get it, get it big, get it very, very visible. Uh, create good questions, uh, get first, second, third line together and create good questions based on the information that you need. And then move those questions out further towards the customer. And if you can put stickers, if you can put, uh, um, once you're going to call the customer, here's the questions that first line or support, here's the questions they're going to ask. Um, and then, uh, yes. Hi there. Uh, um, while you, uh, just, just on that point, number three, can you explain the shift left um, with questions again in a little bit more detail? Yeah, so it's basically moving them from third line to shifting them towards the, it's like this agile term, shift left. Uh, I don't know if I even I should have put it there because I have to explain it. So, uh, um, but it's sort of like moving things more towards a, a self a self uh, service portal of FAQ would be a really good example of shifting left. So shifting out of IT, moving towards the towards the customer. And then what we do is then we move it exactly out towards uh, the technical things that can go wrong. Now here's a question none of you have asked uh, so far, and that is um, how can we ask all of these questions if we have the customer on the phone? Uh, it can be towards automation, but with a typical FAQ, that's true, Paul. So I, it's, it's, I have this uh, like shift left with a sort of like the same, the same concept to just move it out um, so instead of you having to ask all the questions, the customer knows the questions. So if Liverpool is on the TV I, and my, something's on wrong with my TV box, I call the customer and say, here's the answer to all the questions that you should know to fix my problem as fast as possible. Are you ready? And they go, okay, let's go. And I say, that's good because I just had this workshop you guys last week. Let's go. Here's the answers. So I give them the answers before they ask any questions. How can you get away with asking all of these questions to the customer? That's like a typical question I usually get. And uh, one of, the, one of the, 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 the actual sentence we use in real life is the following. I have a set of questions that if I ask them and I get the answer from you, I'm pretty sure that we can do the support ticket faster. Do you want to play the game or not? And usually if we set it up that way, the customer says, okay, let's go. 
So that's how we do it. I've got a set of 12 questions that I have to get through these questions. And if I can get through these questions, I can pretty much guarantee a faster, faster service. Do you want to, do you want to go through the questions? Yeah, let's go. That's the, the way that we, 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 we launched those questions. And number four, practice the method. It's a method, it's a simple, simple method just based on questions, but you have to practice. How do we do those questions in task forces when we have one person from, from Norway, one person from India, one person from Singapore in the middle of the night? How do you do that? If everybody has the same set of questions, everybody has the same set of questions online in the task force, then you know which questions are coming. And if you're sitting with information that you know when something happened, you know that when is question when two. That's question seven on the list. You know your time's going to come. So you know that the, the, the person that leads this is going to go through what, is going to go through where, is going to go through when. So people know what questions are going to come. And that is really, really nice way of doing it. So, so whenever I lead this, it's like, okay, uh, Thomas, do you have, any, do you have an, any more information to what one? Yes or no? No? Okay, be quiet. Uh, Ola, do you have any uh, information for what two? Yes or no? Yes. What is the information that you have? Do you have any more information? No? Okay, be quiet. Then we move on to question where, where one. So we go back to, uh, let's choose some, uh, to Tim. Tim, do you have any, uh, do you have any information on when one? Yes or no? Uh, no, I have no information. Great, move along, please. Next one. That's how we really, it's really brutal when we do this. So we need a leader that's trained in this method and just like really, we treat people like really, yes, no, okay, no, be quiet, don't interrupt. That's the way we run through this method. Uh, I saw a question here in the chat. Is there also a disadvantage for using this method? If you think that the method is going to solve your problem, you've just created another problem. <laughs> Um, so the method doesn't solve problems, but it gives you the lid on the jigsaw. It definitely gives you the full cover on the jigsaw. Um, another is that people are going to uh, think that uh, I don't like this. I like to do it my own way. So that would be, that's not like a disadvantage of the method. Uh, another would be that for simple, for very simple problems, this would be overkill. This is definitely overkill for really simple problems, but usually... Uh, what sometimes happens is that after you thought something was a simple problem, you find out 15, 20, two days later, oh, this wasn't uh, simple. Uh, this wasn't simple at all. This was a uh, pretty, com we should have started documenting this stuff from the start. Can somebody get the customer on the phone again, please? <laughs> You're going to irritate customers. Uh, other question here, getting the right info is currently more difficult with the amount of remote workers. Yep. For instance, you don't have the option of the caller turning to a neighbor to see if they're having the same problem. How should this be tackled? That's, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, it, it definitely makes it more difficult. Um, and I'd say that would be like a really nice role play to do when things are calm and things are working. That would be a nice, uh, a nice way to, uh, to a nice situation that you could plan. Here's the problem that we have. How would we go about solving this? I think that would be nice. That's sort of like a, like choose something that would be difficult. I would think shift left the, that we educate clients on how to report an issue. Yep, they know upfront that any issue for application X needs to be a particular log file. Probably can, yep, that'd be great. We'll have a recording of the session on YouTube. We'll post links on Slack and LinkedIn. How different is Kepner Fuego than Kepner Fury methods? All right. So Kepner Fury is much more, as far as I know, it's much more IT. Uh, I almost became a Kepner Fury instructor. Um, but I didn't. Um, but it's it has its own take on this. So I'd say if I, without without being I don't know I'd say it as careful as I can that the original hardcore is Kepner Trego, and then there's like a section there's something that went off to the side called Kepner Fury, and the reason I have no idea, and uh, if it's any better or I, I have no idea. Um, I sort of like un I understand the full Kepner Trego, and then I've used that my own ways of using that. So I hope that was an okay, uh, okay answer to that. And um, there is a really nice book called uh, Solve It or Solve IT, Solve It, Solve IT. And that, that's, that's also linked up to uh, Kepner Fury method as well. Um, but I, I, I love simplicity. I really love simplicity. Uh, when we're doing in-service desk, an incident and problem, things have to be simple. One of the most simple things you can start doing is just getting people to be really aware. Are we trying to solve the, real, the, real, the same problem, which is one object and one deviation? And you'll find out that straight away from there that you're not. Come with more questions in the chat, please, people. Come on.
So, um, Brendan, just while we're waiting for other people to ask questions, um, this is just one method of problem solving. There, there are many other methods in, in uh, for problem solving, but they're all basically around asking questions, isn't it? So, um, I guess a, a key element that people need to uh, get, get their heads around is that they need to get better at asking questions. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, and it's something that I guess that uh, most people here think that they don't need to. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean them, but I definitely mean you. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's one of those areas that, uh, that when we role play it, we see that we're not that good at it. So, uh, I mean, I train my eight-year-old on this, like, uh, and uh, I've had this in another, I don't know if any of you guys have been in another of any of my, of my sessions here, but I call this like being more interested and uh, the way to be more interested is to ask more open questions. And one of the best skills that we can give kids is to, be, to teach them open questions. One of the best um, uh, gimmicks that we can give teenagers, like teenagers are impressive when they can talk to adults. I think that's an impressive skill of teenagers who can talk to adults is an impressive skill. And that you, you see some teenagers that are great at talking to adults and listen to the way they talk. And you'll hear that they're asking, they're asking open questions. If a teenager gets a question, what did you? What are your plans for the summer? And then they say, "Oh, we're going to, we're going to Sweden." What are your plans? They'll ask a question back, and you think, "Like, wow, that was a, that was impressive." They've sort of understood this, and you'll also hear something similar from people that are really good in first line service desk and and project manager and even salespeople. I mean, I drill these question skills with salespeople as well. Like, are we good at asking questions? The, and what type of questions do we ask? Um, so I think question skills is at the core of, I definitely agree, of most problem management uh, or problem solving uh, methods, definitely. But just I, I've always loved Kepner Trago for its simplicity and lack of um, difficult language. I love the, just the simple language around Kepner Trago. Everybody sort of like just understands it. Um, my experience says if the method is intuitive and simple, it is much easier to convince people to use it. Yeah, but I think once you get in, the, once you get into the the field of trying to convince people, then I just uh, that's it. Then I'm not I'm not there anymore. <laughs> so it's like uh, this shouldn't be like uh, trying to convince people. People should see like uh, I think my service desk might have use for this, and then it's like uh, so it gets back to this idea of we should never sell, but uh, we can definitely buy. So no selling. Yeah. So I, I think um, uh, we're pretty much um, at the end. There's no one, uh, no further questions. I'm happy to open it up to the audience. If um, if any of you want to actually ask the question yourselves directly, please do so now. Um, yeah. I've got a question there. Have you known project managers yes. use KT method for risk analysis? Yep, definitely. Uh, we use that. Uh, there's a, a large company in Scandinavia that I've used that with. We've taken that in in, uh, in projects. And we use it, uh, and we do, and it's it's like a very simple method that we use maybe uh, uh, every other week. Then we do a forty-five minute workshop on on this very simple risk uh, risk management. It's called potential problem analysis. It's the yellow part, and it's uh, it's just so simple that people understand it instead of having to go on a risk management uh, course. The author of Solve IT book that's uh, I can I'd be guessing at, I'm not sure if it's if it's written by Kepner Furi. Uh, but I'd be guessing there, but uh, you can check it out. It's a, it's like a, this orange and yellow cover, but and just like big letters on the front of solve solve it solve IT. It's really good, uh, really good. But quest, wow, that was a long question. Question into the void seems to assume that the questioner knows the questions that would exhaust the investigation. But sometimes answers can be missed just because the questioner does not know the question to ask. How do you know when a genuine void has been reached? You don't. I, there is no more relevant information to find, yep, rather than your questions are insufficient for the term. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice one. Um, so I, I think the short answer is no, you don't. <laughs> but it's like, uh, you can definitely ask more. Like you can definitely say, so like ask the open question of what other information do you have? This is an open question. What other information do you have that you think might be important for solving this incident, or solving this problem? So you can, you can ask like what else what what other type of questions but it's a, a good question from jonah i uh, hope that was okay of an answer Irfan, how does one convince an organization to adopt company trego i wouldn't as a framework rather than their existing method i wouldn't uh, and it's, it's always like Kepner trego i think has always been like the, this idea of 
if what you're using is working okay, if it's working fine, keep using it. So Captain Trago has never really taken this like this big jump out to say, look at us, look at us, we're amazing. But a lot of organizations have taken it, uh, taken it on board. So I think that um, one way of using Captain Trago, if I was the boss, I definitely drill. This is like the test. So I, I only sort of deliver workshops that I can go good for. And if I was the boss of a service operations or service team, I'd drill them on question skills, definitely. Uh, and I'd have a set of questions for things that can go wrong. And I'd have a, a competence skills matrix of, uh, of dynamic problem solving groups. Uh, that I definitely do. So the beauty of this method is that the simplicity of this method allows it to be used quickly when any complex issues occur. Yep, that's that's a nice way to put it. Mm. A lot of great questions here, Dev. Yes, they are They're great, and the, the interaction has been brilliant. I'd just like to remind everyone who's still on that um, you can um, find uh, uh, our information on uh, LinkedIn, and you can also uh, join us on Slack, join Mentoring Professionals on Slack, and you're going to have access to about 28, 29 other um, mentors that you can directly engage with, uh, engage with, as well as Brendan and myself. Um, so, um, if you are interested, then certainly um, do do uh, look at, at joining our, our group. Um, we also have uh, another the, the next fortnight um, full of um, sessions on on various topics. So, uh, have a look and book yourselves on there. And if you have any more inf uh, questions for Brendan, please don't hesitate to send them in, and we'll get Brendan to answer. Uh, answer them. Brendan, I think there's a good good question to uh, sort of end on from Paul, which is, mm -hmm. how do you avoid question fatigue? Now, who's, who's, who has the fatigue here? Is it the, is it the, <laughs> the questioner or the, pe the person being questioned? Uh, Paul, Paul, can you answer that? Uh, question fatigue. You can unmute so, yourself, Paul, if you want to have a, if you want to have a chat with Brendan. <laughs> if this is, uh, if he's looking for a dating advice, uh, is it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, we're, we're not that far away from from dating advice when we go through like asking questions uh, the person answering so i think the thing is that uh, it's it's one way that i'm a big believer in disclaimers so you have to say that uh, i'm going to have to ask uh, 12 questions uh, but once i ask those questions i'm pretty sure that i'd be able to help you much better and much faster uh, so if you say it from the start it's like asking somebody would you like to go for a run in the forest but don't tell them how far you're going to run you, they're going to get fatigued. But if you say, I'd like to go for a run, but it's only going to be for 30 minutes, that's it. So that's the way I do it. Uh, we sort of have to come with disclaimers before you ask a lot of questions. Because if you, do, if you don't, you might experience people saying, and I've heard this a lot, uh, what is this? Some sort of interrogation. So that's what you get back. But if you come with uh, the, that disclaimer first, I have to ask a lot of questions. You might feel like this is an interrogation. But if I get to ask those questions, then I'm pretty sure that you'll get... Uh, you get the answer much, or we'll be able to fix this much faster. Uh, another thing, uh, Dev, I, uh, I can export, because this is on Miro, I can export this uh, and uh, we can make this available. We do that on the LinkedIn group. Yeah, we can, we can do yeah. that. Um, so we will have a recording of this session and what we'll include in the recording is also a couple of links to some of the things that you mentioned. For example, uh, Brendan, you mentioned the open questions, the list of open questions. So we can, we can uh, uh, have a link to that, as well as um, to this presentation uh, itself. Good. Okay, great. Thank you all once again. Thanks, everybody. Good luck. Bye-bye.